welcome to another broadcast from MindYourHealthCast.com. As you'll recall, maybe if you watched the last broadcast, we were talking about the critical factors uh, in cell membrane and health that have to do with sugars and fatty acids. Now, I realize that to most people, sugar is sugar, but there's a lot more to it than that. Uh, most people, what they think of as sugar is the granulated sugar that they purchase and use as table sugar, which is really sucrose, which is a disaccharide, meaning there's two sugars combined together, and those sugars are fructose and glucose. And in the body, they get separated uh, in the presence of water and break up into the two types of sugars. Now, the one that most people then think about is glucose, which is in fact one of those two sugars, and that is the one that the body uses to burn for energy. Now, glucose is a good sugar in the sense that it's necessary in the body to burn for energy. However, most people are totally unaware of a whole group of sugars that are now being referred to as glyconutrients. And so we're going to work on clarifying those a little bit. It, but the problem is, of course, that the whole subject, is, because it is new, is going to be difficult. And so you're going to have to put in a little effort uh, to look into it farther and to begin to glean an understanding. Now, I mentioned on the last broadcast that there is a book that's on the market called Sugars That Heal, The New Healing Science of Glyconutrients. This book is written by Amo I. Mondoa, M.D., and a co-author who probably did a lot of the writing, because usually in the books of this nature, the doctor will provide the basic material but it's not necessarily a good writer, which happens in a lot of cases. And so he engages someone else who is very familiar with natural health, uh, and they in turn put together his information in a readable form so that people can understand a little bit about it. So they're able to translate the more technical information into um, a text that uh, is more readily read and absorbable. But this one is a good book to give you some basic understanding. Now they talk about in, in that book the eight basic ones, but it appears that there's probably more. I've seen some research that showed at least ten, and there's probably even others yet. But these all have important functions in the body, and in particular some of these glyconutrients are extremely important in the cell membrane. If you remember that the cell membrane is made up of phosphorus and fats uh, called lipoproteins, uh, I mean in a sense, um, but they're, the, the term is phospholipids. And the phospholipids make a double layer of membrane which becomes the cell wall, which becomes very important. Now we're going to talk about the importance of it but I'm also going to have to alert you at this point that if you start reading about this, you start thinking, as so many people do today, in terms of diseases and taking some of these specific sugars for different diseases. Now, in natural medicine, that is not accurate. We don't treat diseases, and that's a big problem because medicine has reduced everything down to a diagnosed disease and then they come up with various types of chemicals that will either inhibit or overstimulate body functions to offset those symptoms so that t sometimes the people feel better and then the problem is however they haven't really corrected anything and the person in the background has to deal with two things. One is the fact that the problem has not been corrected, and number two, they have to deal with the fact that the medications have their own adverse effects on top of it, meaning that they create other problems in the process. 
because I, I really haven't seen any medications put out by the pharmaceuticals uh, since they're not carrying anything that do not have a, ver a whole package of adverse effects. In fact, every substance does. Uh, and in homeopathic medicine, that's how they came up with what ones you would use for a person because the symptom picture became the expression of a disorder or a disturbance or a malfunction going on in a person and they then picked a remedy, as they refer to them, that would match that picture and would then help the body to carry on the process it was carrying on and therefore correct it. So, however, they were not treating a disease, they were treating the person. And by correcting the person's functions, then the body was able to correct that set of symptoms that were diagnosed as the disease. Now, I know it's hard to understand, and even people within the natural health field have a lot of confusion um, basically, I would say a high percentage of them use the same nomenclature, uh, the same diagnosed disease issues, and then they uh, want to come up with something natural that will also then manage the problem, uh, and the people will feel better, but have not really solved the problem. Now, if you go back, of course, and study the history of medicine, you also then realize that all of the first medications that medicine had, especially in this country and I assume around the world, uh, were herbs. And of course herbs given in a sufficient concentration will mask the symptoms that a person's body is expressing. And if you of course take too much you actually will have the same problem you have with a regular drug you will reach a stage of toxicity and then uh, you'll get a reversal effect, meaning you've given so much of it that now it's actually producing symptoms in the person and therefore it's worse and if you continue to increase the dose, you finally reach a point where some of the people are going to be really poisoned with the substance even though in the beginning under normal circumstances and normal concentrations, it would not be a problem. In regular medicine, you have something called a therapeutic or effective dose window. And that window is at what level of concentration for that person will this substance manage those symptoms. So the therapeutic window for many of the modern drugs, which are extremely toxic, is very narrow. So if you get below that effective dose window or the um, therapeutic window, nothing happens. And if you go beyond that, then of course you move into a toxic level. And so they have a very narrow zone that's usable and they have to titrate it technically for that person. Now in actual practice it doesn't work that way. Uh, many of the doctors use the dose that is given in the uh, physician's uh, diagnostic and treatment books uh, or the PDR uh, and if it gives a certain recommended dose that actually is for about a 154 pound man. Now in pharmacology you're supposed to titrate that up or down based on that. So you're supposed to first of all select your drug. Number two, you take that recommended dose and if the person is a much lighter weight wise then you titrate down. If they're much heavier then you have to titrate up. If it's female versus a male you most often have to titrate down. And if you're going to children you have to titrate way down. And Unfortunately, most doctors don't take the time to do that. They kind of shoot from the hip. So if it says uh, the average dose is 300 milligrams, then they give you 300 milligrams. So if you're way too heavy, it's not going to have the effect they're looking for. And if it's uh, um, way too light, you're not going to have the effect. 
So you need to remember that in natural medicine, you're going to run in when you start looking at these glyconutrients a lot of criticism because they're going to say, well, gee, where are the studies that show that this helps this particular disease or that it will treat it? And of course, in true natural medicine, you're not going to find anything that is going to treat the disease. You're going to find substances that can help correct the body and in the process of the body correcting itself or being able to correct itself, then that symptom package diagnosed as a disease will disappear. So it's very difficult for a lot of people to relate to that because for years now we've been bombarded with the idea of you take this thing for this disease. And as I say, unfortunately, a lot of the natural people have done the same thing. So you hear such terms as, well, if you take this, it's a natural antibiotic. Well, we're, we're not wanting to kill microbes. That's not the purpose of it. And if you don't understand the, the function of strep and staph and a lot of these substances uh, or microbodies, uh, if you don't understand that, you think that's what you have to do is kill those. And if you don't understand that, one of the best things to do is that we have done a broadcast before on something called homotoxicology. And homotoxicology is basically how the body gets sick and how it gets well. But we're not talking about diseases per se, we're just talking about what is the progression of the person's body getting more and more out of balance and attempting to make those corrections. And so you will find that bacterial forms such as strep which always lives in your throat and staph that always lives in your nose many times are part of the process of your body getting rid of something because if the strep is already in your throat and you develop a problem then the level of strep increases as more of the toxins are being eliminated by the body. And it's it, at the beginning it sounds like totally foreign, but once you understand the concept then it all begins to make sense. And I know how well it makes sense because uh, many years ago, and I, I mentioned that in the broadcast, and that broadcast is available uh, as a DVD from our website and some handouts that go with it so you kind of get the picture. And, and I know once you see the picture, it all falls into place and it all begins to make sense. I, I did a, a big seminar for a group of pharmacists several years ago and they were wanting to learn something about natural medicine. And I was hired to come and do a two-day program on homotoxicology. And so, in so doing, at the beginning, of course, they were highly skeptical because uh, in the process, if you really understand it, you find out that there's no need of antibiotics for strep throat and staph infections and all these things that people talk about. And so at the end of two days, out of about a hundred, almost all were pharmacists. I think there was a couple of three MDs that were present, uh, but most were pharmacists. But at the end of two days, out of all the 100, there was not one that argued the case for antibiotics. And never at any time did I try to convince them not to use antibiotics. What I did do is show how people get sick what's involved, what the symptoms mean, and therefore if you can help the person's body deal with the issue, then you don't need to kill anything, you only need to help the body correct itself. And once that clicked with them, then that was the end of it. They, they had no argument after that because it, it made sense, and it does. Um, so if if you want to get a better understanding, not only of what we're talking about today, but how the body handles itself in general, then I would, I would get the DVD and get the handouts and take some time to go through it and it will change the way you look at everything. You'll know that all these symptoms are going to be of two types as a rule. 
they're going to be either symptoms of the immune system kicking in, one part of it being inflammation, where you get redness, heat, swelling, and pain. Now, inflammation is not a disease. Inflammation is a process initiated by your body to try to get rid of something that shouldn't go there. Now, there's a few cases where the toxins themselves are so toxic that they actually shut down certain processes or distort them in your body, and so the symptoms may be related to the toxins. For example, if you are poisoned with mercury, it's going to bring on a whole set of neurological symptoms and immune symptoms. Or if you're poisoned by lead or aluminum or some of these metals, they're going to bring on a certain set of symptoms because they shut certain things down. And so it's a different picture than other things like getting some toxin in your body or even a virus that your body's going to get rid of. It's going to initiate this inflammatory process. So you get the redness, heat, swelling, and pain. And if it's too bad, uh, meaning if it's more significant, then the body may initiate a fever. And with homotoxicology, um, which was developed by a medical doctor in Germany years ago by the name of Hans Heinrich Reckeweg, uh, if you understand that, which he came to understand, it changed his whole outlook and his whole methodology because he ended up going to homeopathic therapy as a way of helping people get well. And he makes the comment in his writings, and he wrote a very big, thick book on homotoxicology, and what I give you in that particular broadcast is, is a very, very basic synopsis of what he was talking about. He goes into the chemistry and um, the body's immune system, how it works, and a lot of uh, biochemistry and so forth, so that people of a more scientific bent can relate to it. But nonetheless, it's that understanding uh, that led him a totally different direction. And he said that pneumonia, which of course is not a disease, um, pneumonia is the body mobilizing an immune response to clean debris from the lungs. Now, he said that every year, as a practicing doctor, he had cases of pneumonia that died. But he said once he understood what was going on in the body and he selected the appropriate homeopathic remedies to work with the person, that he never had any more deaths from pneumonia. Because now he understood what the process was. When you get a lot of viral particles and a lot of debris and a lot of things accumulate in the lungs, you end up many times with a very thick sludgy material, which the body has difficulty getting rid of. So in the pneumonia process, the body uh, sets in motion inflammation in the lungs, which means it brings in more blood, more lymph, more white cells, and more oxygen to help clear that out. And the correct homeopathic can intensify that action and can give the body more of a boost, like having a um, jumper that adds more energy so the body can clear it out. So then the next process is that all of this thick sludge is converted to a more fluid type material, which is what they call pneumonia, and then your body initiates a coughing process to get it out. Now, if you help it to do that, then the pneumonia, what they diagnose as pneumonia, clears out. But if you understand it in terms of homotoxicology, it makes sense what the best treatment is. Now, you can give antibiotics and stop the process because antibiotics have a tendency to turn off immune function. So if you want to turn off the immune function and stop the symptoms, you can do that, but it's not gone. And the reason I know it's not gone is down the road, years later, I get a patient and they've had ongoing respiratory issues, and when we correct it, that's exactly what happens. The inflammation flares up, they get the same symptoms of what medicine would diagnose as pneumonia, which they call a disease, and you, you reverse that, but they don't really even have that, they just have the symptoms of it, 
as they're clearing out the lungs. Now some of it the body can take back through the lymph and neutralize it and then empty it into the blood, goes to the liver, it's finally detoxified and then the body expels it or gets rid of it. But if, um, if you stop that process it stays there and to me it sets the stage for down the road lung cancer because now the cells become poisoned and when you again Look at homotoxicology, you're going to see what all that means. So with that understanding, then other things that I'm saying today are going to make more sense. So the fact is, as I said, we don't treat diseases. That's not the process. What we do is we restore the body's ability to correct itself, which is basically where you, you get real health. Now you may feel no symptoms because you've arrested the problem but it doesn't mean that the problem is gone and of course the other would could be tuberculosis if you suppress enough poisons in the lungs at some point you actually start to destroy tissue now the bacterial forms as a rule their job is to digest out this toxic material to keep you from being poisoned more with it and they use it as food. In fact, that's what they do in our body. They're the cleanup crew. They live there and they break down these poisons so that your body doesn't become overly poisoned and overly sick. However, the big problem is, is if you don't allow that to happen, then you've got a big problem. And so sometimes, because toxins can be a big part of the problem, we many times have to clear those out too and that's where that term detox comes from. A lot of the things that we ingest or breathe in uh, from our environment are very toxic in the body. And a little bit isn't a problem on one occasion but if you keep doing it over and over and over like ingesting pesticides or chemicals from the environment like uh, various types of solvents or food additives that come from coal tar and or petroleum products um, either as preservatives or food colorings and so forth. All of these things over time accumulate in the body until finally one day you reach such a toxic load that something is affected and doesn't work right anymore. Now you have a big problem. All these chronic illnesses that we're seeing today are coming from not, I would say, two big things. We've talked recently about the nutritional aspect because if you're nutritionally deficient, your body cannot operate properly either. And so if you accumulate the poisons and you're nutritionally deficient, you're in big trouble because many of these body functions require specific things such as minerals and trace minerals and of course vitamins and all of the other things that are necessary, fatty acids, to make everything work properly. So if you're deficient in those already you're in trouble and then if you add more from the environment the body's ability to clear that is impaired to the point that it cannot do so. Then you get into a degenerative state. Now when you go and look at homotoxicology you find out that there is a line that when you cross that line you now are getting into a chronic degenerative problem. Whereas if your body can respond immediately, meaning it can inflame and bring on an immune response, it can neutralize the poisons and then they're excreted out of the body and then it's all finished. You don't develop chronic illnesses. But if they are not cleared out, and they stay there and you keep adding more and more and more which means every time you get something going on you go and take more antibiotics or more steroids to suppress it then at some point you cross that line which really is the border to a cell. You cross the membrane of the cell, you get inside the cell and now you begin to disrupt the chemistry of the cell. Now the cell membrane is what controls and keeps everything working right as far as what's getting in the cell or not getting in the cell. And most people don't think about how critical the cell membrane is. Now I mentioned the last broadcast, Dr. Bruce Lipton, who I'm not even sure exactly what his title is. He is like a cell biologist 
Uh, he understands microbiology and biochemistry and all of the things that go with it. But he basically, at some point in his career of teaching about the cell and the function of the cell, came to realize one day that it wasn't the nucleus of the cell where the DNA is that controls cell function. It was the cell membrane. And so the cell membrane has to be built out of good material to carry out its job properly. And if it does, it's the cell membrane that regulates all the other functions in the cell, including tapping the information from the DNA library, which is what the DNA is. It's a library of information of how to build certain proteins in the body. In other words, it provides that template of information via creating something called RNA, or messenger RNA, RNA in particular, which then brings together uh, amino acids to form protein chains, first peptides, then protein chains, which then enfold to form protein molecules, which helps the body rebuild itself and carry on all kinds of functions. So that's basically what the library does. So he came to realize that it was the cell membrane that was the brain of the cell which acts like a uh, uh, microprocessor in a sense in a computer. It, it does all the regulation. It has receptor sites that receive information from the outside if the membrane is built properly and it then carries this information inside the cell and once it's inside the cell, it goes to the proper organelles inside the cell to carry out the various functions, including going to the DNA and saying, okay, we need to build some of this protein. And when that all comes together, it all works very well. <clears throat> but if it isn't going to pass that through properly, then the messages can get distorted and then the cells begin to malfunction and all kinds of things happen. And the fact is that the cell membranes carry on a lot of different functions, one of which is they, if they are built from the right material, they act like a capacitor. Now, I don't know if you know what a capacitor is, but a capacitor in electronics is when you have two uh, plates separated by a di something that's called a dielectric, which could be air, it could be... Uh, wax paper, it could be some type of inert material that's non-conductive, which means electrons cannot move through it. And so the cell membrane forms an electropotential across from the inside to the outside. And in a normal healthy cell, that normally is about 70 to 80 millivolts all the way up to 120 millivolts in an extremely healthy cell. That helps maintain all the functions of that membrane by having that electrical field present. And it's very important that the cell membranes be intact and they don't leak. Now in electronics, if you get a capacitor, for example, that's overloaded with electrons, it can burn through the insulation between the two layers and short and therefore kaput. It doesn't work right and of course it can ruin something in the electronic circuit. So capacitors serve a uh, isolating or insulating effect to allow certain things to happen. Now they also can combine with other electronic components to carry out various types of electronic functions but the important thing is that they will store an electrical charge. In fact depending on how large the plates are and how much of an insulator you have between those two plates. Now remember I said that the membrane is a double layer and so it, it actually acts like an insulator between those two layers and carries on this membrane charge. And um, the bigger the plates are and the more powerful the dielectric is to not allow a leakage you can build a tremendous charge. Now in televisions, for example, when you're in the high voltage circuits in television, you could be dealing with 20, 25,000 volts. And so there are capacitors in those circuits and they are able to withstand 25,000 volts. Now many, many years ago, I'll just throw this in for information for those of you who are curious, 
many, many years ago when they were first getting into atom smashing, this is back around World War II, when they were talking about building the first atomic bomb, um, they needed to convert one element to another element by bombarding it with a high energy charge. So, for example, uranium occurs in nature as an element of U-238, which has to do with the protons and the, uh, neutrons in these, the nucleus of the atom. So, however, that's not radioactive that you would need to produce a bomb or any kind of radioactive activity. So you have to break some of the uh, nucleus out, basically knock neutrons out, uh, to get it to a level uh, where it becomes unstable and therefore radioactive. And so they had to use a high energy beam of electrons to bombard it to make that happen. Or they could use protons to do it also. But at any rate, one of the first atom smashers was developed by two scientists by the name of Cockcroft and Walton. And what they did, they took huge capacitors, I mean we're talking about giant capacitors, that the dielectric was a very non-conductive oil between those. And if you build a lot of heat, when you can, which you can with high voltage, they even would circulate the oil through coolers to cool it down because it would tend to get very hot with such high voltages. So they could build up a half a million or a million volts of electricity on these plates and so they would have a whole series of those and then what they would do is they had a switching mechanism that would suddenly put them all together in series and add the voltage together of each of the capacitors and produce a tremendous electrical spark actually uh, that would bombard the uranium and knock out some neutrons and convert it to U-235. And so you can you in, um, build tremendous charge if you have big enough plates and if you have a strong enough dielectric to keep them separated so they don't short circuit across. And so, in a sense, our membrane is the same way in our cells. Now, we're not talking those kind of voltages, but we are talking, uh, like I say, on the average 70 to 120 millivolts. Now, what can happen to the cell is if that drops in voltage because of leakage, which it could, uh, because the cell wall is defective, uh, or being deficient in electrons to begin with because uh, we've mentioned before about the electronics of the body that your body has to have electrons and protons which are negative and positive charges that move through the body through certain circuits to make everything work. Now if you're deficient of electrons of course then you can't build a charge because you just don't have those electrons. Now we've talked before about bioelectronic vincent, which was a system developed out of France originally and researched heavily by German doctors I studied with as to the ability to measure in your body how that status is. Do you have enough protons? Do you have enough electrons? And do you have something else which was an electrolyte, which is um, do you have these conductive ions that can conduct the electrons because electrons need conductive ions to move and go any place. So at any rate, if you don't have the electrons, you can't build them up. And so you, that is an important factor. And where do we get the electrons? Well, uh, a lot of the food, if it's good food and it's not ruined and it comes from good soil, is going to have a high electron content. And something else we mentioned a while back about something now called earthing, it used to be called grounding, which means there's a way uh, to draw electrons from the ground because the earth has electrons in, in the earth itself and there's a way of connecting yourself to the earth and drawing electrons. So people who are low in electrons because of the way we live today, I won't go into all the details, but because of our lifestyle, the structures we're in, and so forth, we can definitely become deficient in electrons. 
Now the problem is if we become a deficient in both electrons and protons, which are hydrogen ions, carrying a positive charge, then we are in danger of serious health problems, cardiovascular uh, and cancer. And that can happen when you have a deficiency of those and therefore you cannot maintain a voltage on the cell wall and if you can't maintain the voltage it will not keep the bad things out and the good things in and allow the necessary things to come in and the byproducts to travel back out of the cell. That transportation through that cell membrane becomes very important. Now I think that if you're going to really get serious about understanding health and sickness you would probably want to get Bruce Lipton's book on um, the biology of belief and he talks about that heavily about the function of the cell membrane and how important it is and how it's the brain of the cell but it has to have certain things which means there's other things that can affect it such as emotional state and uh, toxins from the environment as well as deficiencies and I know of course one of the major minerals that are necessary for proper cell membrane function is magnesium and a tremendous amount of people are deficient in magnesium today. It's not one of the easier elements to absorb and if your body is out of balance and not working right or if your diet is very poor and deficient, you can be low in magnesium. Uh, low magnesium many times is the cause of high blood pressure. So a high blood pressure is not a disease as we think of it, it can be a deficiency. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why, because uh, the nervous system is involved in a lot of, a lot of factors. But the fact is that um, there is a treatment in natural medicine to make sure that high blood pressure is not being caused by magnesium or whether it is. And that's called the Myers cocktail. Those who are in natural medicine will have heard of it. But you can take some with high, with high blood pressure, test their blood pressure, give them an IV push of this Mirror's Cocktail which is basically high in magnesium over about 8 minutes plus or minus and retake the blood pressure if it's come way down then you know that the person has high blood pressure because it's missing magnesium and so in this case supplementing a form of magnesium that the person can absorb can help the body rid itself of that problem. So as I say pretty much all the health problems are either going to be toxin problems or deficiency problems and when I say toxins it can be toxins from without or it can be toxic emotions so both of those can have a big effect on function in the body. Um, we have talked before about the emotional side in fact just recently we were talking about placebo and nocebo uh, and the mind-body connection but at any rate that cell function it only works good if the membrane is good and the two big big key factors is the right sugars because there are lipoproteins that are actually uh, signal sites on the surface of the cell membrane that actually send out and bring back information to the cell. So they are made from the right kind of fats and the right kind of sugars and it's not the glucose that's the messenger and it's certainly not the uh, fructose that are the two parts of table sugar which is referred to as sucrose but there are some very specific glyconutrients that have to be present to build these uh, receptor sites that receive information and send out information. Now when the cells come next to each other they interconnect with each other via these channels and therefore in essence if the body has the proper nutrients it can communicate between all the cells in the body. Now when we talked some about cancer we talked about the fact that the cancer cell becomes dysfunctional, it changes its whole chemistry and it disconnects from the adjoining cells so it becomes now a renegade cell operating on its own without any controls. Normally the body controls via the mind, the autonomic system, the replication of cells and so we don't have all the cells in the body overgrowing. If we did we would have a big problem. 
Um, there's a few other little factors that we could talk about in relation to that, which we're not going to have time that goes beyond the scope of what we're discussing today. But it's very important that you understand how these things all work together. And one of the big problems, of course, as I say, is deficiency. And it can be a deficiency of these other sugars other than table sugar. And these other sugars, as I say, there's some companies have isolated eight and they actually make supplements to put them in the body. Now the sugars don't cure anything, but what they do is they take their place in the various functions of the body so that the body can work right to do its own thing or take care of its own problems. When you do that, then the body is able to be healthy and to correct itself if temporarily something unbalances it, it can bounce right back because it has all, everything in working order to carry it out. So the cells do tremendous things, we, which again we don't have time to go into detail. Maybe one of these days we'll do one just on cell function and talk about all the things that the cell does that are extremely important uh, for us to maintain our health. And as I say, if we're missing certain key elements, not just macro minerals, but trace elements, because they're not in the soil, they're not in the food, and therefore we don't have them. Uh, if we're missing those, then a lot of these functions don't work properly, and then we, we get in trouble. Now medicine, of course, as I say, regular medicine, they're not too concerned with why you have the problem. All they need to know is what are your symptoms, and then we're going to give you a drug that we have found that in most cases, or at least some cases, I, I shouldn't even say most cases because it's only some cases, that that drug is going to manage that symptom either by turning something off, you know, it's like a fire alarm goes off and you go and you disconnect the fire alarm. Now you don't have to listen to that alarm anymore, but that doesn't stop a fire that may be raging someplace. And I think I mentioned before, if not I'll mention again anyhow, uh, one of my patients had a huge racetrack worth millions of dollars, in fact probably about twenty million dollars, and their fire alarm went off. And so of course it was set for different zones of the racetrack, so they went to the zone indicated and could find no fire, no smoke or anything, so they went back and reset it. It went off again. They repeated that several times and finally they called the alarm company and they came out, went through the same process and said, well, there must be something wrong with uh, a short in the circuit or something's going on, so we'll just disable it. So they did. They disabled the alarm circuit and the owner of the racetrack went home and in the middle of the night was called by the fire department that the racetrack was on fire. They had a $20 million fire. What it ended up was that when they wired it, it was wired to the wrong section as to what it indicated it was wired to, so they didn't look in the right place. Uh, and consequently they missed the fire. So turning off the fire alarm did not turn off the fire. The same as when your body is producing symptoms, that's an alarm that something is going on. If you turn those symptoms off, you haven't corrected the problem. Why do we have so many serious chronic illnesses today and you know I, I don't even have to argue that fact. I think that our current national sick bill already tells us that something isn't right. If all of our modern medicine is so effective and so powerful, why isn't everyone very healthy and why is, are we having to take all these drugs on an ongoing basis, usually year by year adding more and more drugs? And the people in the meantime are going downhill and getting sicker and sicker. Have we seen cancer go down? No, we haven't. In fact, those chronic illnesses are not going down, they're going up. And so now we're, what, a trillion dollars a year to manage symptoms instead of correcting the problem. One of the major problems is the cell membrane, as I mentioned. The cells are not able to function properly. They either don't get the message because all of the internal cell functions pretty much are controlled by signals coming from outside the cell. Those signals, uh, many of them are in the form of something called neuropeptides, which are messengers, messengers or messages from 
um, the nervous system sending a message telling the cell to do certain things. If we have a deficiency of a particular protein in the body because it's wearing out and we need to rebuild, that message goes to those cells in that area to turn on the genes in the library to produce more of that protein so we can rebuild with it. And so that it's very important that those messages get carried into the cell and in, in the case of protein carried to the DNA to bring out of the library the right code to make the right proteins that are necessary at that point. Now when everything is present and working well that's what takes place. But if you don't know that and if you only think the symptom is a disease and you manage the symptom, you're going downhill. And so every time you do that, you're getting worse. Every time you take the antibiotics to suppress the body's immune system, to stop it from getting rid of something that it has inflamed to get rid of, you're making the person sicker. Now they may feel okay and of course that is not an indicator of whether you're healthy or not. Because if your body picks up something extremely toxic, it's going to react to get rid of that. Now does that mean you have a poor immune system? No, it actually means you have a strong immune system. And that's what you want. Now many people pride themselves in saying, well gee, I haven't been sick in years, I haven't had a cold, I haven't had a flu, I don't get sick. Well, I have a, a patient whose husband got a kidney transplant and they gave him this massive program of immunosuppression so his body would not reject a kidney and guess what? With the immune system totally turned off, he feels great. He can do anything he wants, he can eat anything he wants, nothing bothers him, he never has a symptom of anything. Now is he well? Of course not. And at some point that lack of immune response will end up being his demise because he can pick up something such as certain types of viruses that could wipe him out and it really is only the immune system that can get rid of those. And therefore using that as a criteria, well I never get sick and of course I don't know how many of those people I have met who come in to me and say, I can't understand it, I have a very strong immune system, I haven't been sick in years, how could I have cancer now? Or how could I have this or that? Well the reason they can is because their body is not well and it doesn't have a strong immune system, they've been getting sicker for years and they didn't know it. And I've mentioned before, and I'm, I always am bringing all this together because I want to reinforce it so it all comes together as a big picture. Studies have been done by regular medicine, some researchers and have taken thousands of patient files and gone back and reviewed their history over the years and the big conclusion, which of course I've known and most of the people that really understand natural medicine have known, of course the problem didn't start with the chronic illness today or yesterday or last week or last month or even last year, it started years ago and that's what their conclusion was that all the chronic illnesses had their beginning 20 to 30 years ago. But they didn't know it, the patient didn't know it, they thought that every time they had a symptom and took a pill from the pharmaceutical company to turn off that symptom that they were well. And you know there is a point when you can suppress the immune system so much that it just shuts down. And one of the worst things you can have is to have an immune system that's not working because cancer almost always is going to start from a combination of things that cause at least one cell to become mutant, meaning it disconnects from the body, it's been poisoned, it doesn't work the same, and there's nothing to get rid of it. Under normal circumstances, the average healthy person is going to every day, their body is going to have a bad cell or many cells actually, and the immune system is going to wipe them out and that's the end of it. But if you have no immune function and you start forming those cells, they're going to grow. It only takes one mutant cell to grow into a tumor. And that's what the joke of course is of chemotherapy because if you've got millions and millions of cancer cells in your body and you take large doses of chemotherapy, the only way you could possibly kill every one of them is to kill the patient. You would have to give enough of the poison that you totally killed the patient and wiped every cell up. That's the only way you could be sure you've gotten rid of it. 
But of course, it's kind of like, as a friend of mine said, you go and find a bee in your car, you get a flamethrower to get rid of the bee. They dump a lot of poison in the body, but guess what? They really don't actually get rid of every single cancer cell. It only takes one cancer cell to form a tumor, and you're in trouble, especially if you've got no immune system. And pretty much most of the chemotherapeutic agents really wipe out your immune system. So in my estimation, you're going to end up that uh, the very thing that they treated you with and told you, well, you seem to be cancer-free, but they really know that they've not gotten rid of every cell in your body. It's only a matter of time down the road till you're going to have a return. Now, is it going to be a year, two years, maybe up to five years or even after five years? But somewhere that's going to happen. It's going to grow to the point you now have a tumor again because you never got rid of the original problem which was two things, body toxins, emotional and exterior or external, and you did not get rid or did not boost your immune system so your immune system can get rid of those bad cells when they form. Anyhow, that's, that's kind of my big tirade on modern medicine because the facts prove that it's not working. I mean, if you look at around, everybody anymore seems to be on a handful of pills for all these things, but they keep getting more and more pills. How many times do you see them cutting down the pills and taking off of them? Instead, as the body is getting sicker and it's putting out its feeble attempt to get well, every time a new set of symptoms pop up, you get another pill for those symptoms to turn those off. And so it's just a matter of time. But that's one big part of it. The other is the deficiency problem. The deficiency problem is having the right sugars in the body. Now, a healthy body, if given all the nutrients it needs, can convert those. There's pretty strong evidence that it can convert one type to another if needed because the liver is capable of doing all kinds of magical things. For example, the liver can, not every amino acid, but a lot of the amino acids it can convert from one to another as they're needed. That is assuming that the liver is working right. The liver can build all kinds of fatty acids and sterols as needed, such as cholesterol, <clears throat> which is needed throughout the body. And so if it's working right, it can manufacture these things and cause it to work right. Now, I will say that the cell membrane is made up of several factors. I already mentioned the phospholipids, which is a combination of phosphorus, the element phosphorus, and a fatty acid. But there's more than one type of fatty acids involved. In fact, some of these glyconutrients we're talking about are involved in the cell membrane. So we have those because these nutrients will mix with proteins you can have glycoproteins, you can have glycolipids. The lipid and the sugar combine together to form certain type of molecules that are necessary for the body. Especially a lot of those are necessary for the brain nervous system and for the nerve myelin sheath and so forth. And so that's why both the fatty acids and the sugars are important. But certain kinds of those sugars actually help in the messaging system from the cell membrane so that it picks up this message transfers it inside the cell where something called a second messenger picks up that information and carries out some function inside the cell. So you, you have this communication network that requires these special nutrients. And if it's not present, then it can't do that. Now if the cell then, after a while, cannot function right, it, there's going to be some symptoms that are going to come up because now the cell is unable to function properly. And as I say, if you go and learn more about homotoxicology, you're going to see the big picture much better and understand how all of this works. So, there's a lot of criticism of these glyconutrients because, as I said, they're saying, well, gee, there's no research that shows they are good for this disease or that for disease to get rid of the disease. Well, it, of course they won't, because they don't get rid of any disease they're part of the normal function of the body, and when the body functions normally, it can get rid of all kinds of things. 
Now, I, in some respects, I'm kind of oversimplifying because there's a few cases, there's certain factors that come into play, such as epigenetics and a lot of other factors. But at some point, we've mentioned them, and we will again as, as we weave this tapestry and try to bring you this big picture of why we're so sick and what it takes to be well. And it takes all these factors, and there's uh, a lot of good information. I mentioned before a book, and I'm going to mention again, called Deep Nutrition, written by a medical doctor by the name of Catherine Shanahan, and it's called Why Your Genes Need Traditional Food. So now it's being found that even uh, without the right nutrition, uh, even the genetics are affected. And if you want to have a good expression of the good genes, you have to have the right nutrition for that to take place. Okay, so now we've talked a bit about the sugars, and as I say, there, there's eight of them, and um, one of the big factors, however, is to get rid of the table sugar, which is the sucrose. Now, it's in all kinds of things, uh, and unfortunately, and it also has an addictiveness to it, so that when you start, you get more and more. But we know that there's a big problem going on with my sugar metabolism because, guess what has become a new epidemic? It's type 2 diabetes. Now, I think we understand the difference between type 1 and type 2. Type 1, of course, is when there is damage to the islets of Langerhans, which are a portion of the uh, pancreas, and there, there are cells in that area called beta cells that produce insulin. Now, the pancreas as a whole is very sensitive to toxins and chemicals, especially some of the pesticides and a lot of those organic chemicals, they're very sensitive. But they're also sensitive to some viruses. And if the immune system is down and you pick up a virus, that potential is for it to get into the pancreas and damage the islets of longer Han, and in particular the beta cells, and therefore the pancreas ability to produce insulin is so impaired that the person's sugar builds up tremendously because it cannot be transported into the cells for energy because of the fact you're deficient in insulin. So that's type 1 diabetes. That one usually starts very early in childhood when something happens to damage it, and therefore those people are the ones that are from early childhood also on needle insulin. But this type 2 diabetes is a whole different ballgame. And type 2 diabetes, in my estimation, comes because of ingestion of high levels of bad sugar. And of course the body can convert that to fat if it can't use it all. And it goes back to liver and fatty acids, which is the other issue we're talking about. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more, but I still want to do something more with the sugar thing. Uh, because then the insulin, is, although it's being produced by the pancreas, cannot move much of the glucose through the cell wall because the cell wall is defective. And why is the cell wall defective? It can be a combination of the right good sugars, meaning sugars that carry out functions in the body and are not burned for energy like glucose is, there's these other ones that do all these different things. So you could have a deficiency of those, or you could have a deficiency of good fatty acids. Now how can that happen? That means in your diet you are eating bad fats and oils. And what are bad fats and oils? Not cholesterol. <laughs> cholesterol is actually a sterol, cholesterol, and sterols are used to produce hormones, part of the cell wall, and part of a lot of other things that are very important in cellular function. So the cholesterol is very important that you have it to carry on all the processes that you need to. But at any rate, the liver has to make these conversions out of whatever you put into your body. Now, if you put a lot of the polyunsaturated oils in your body, and especially the trans forms of it, the trans meaning that the actual molecule has been twisted the wrong way because of processing, and therefore the body has to have fats to make the cell walls. 
If it does not have good fats, it will use what it has. The unfortunate side of that, of course, is that those fatty acids are defective and when you incorporate them into the cell membrane or the cell wall, depending on which you want to call it, then it does not work right. And therefore the insulin has trouble pushing the sugar, the glucose, into the cell to be burned for energy. And so then the sugar tends to build up in the blood. Now under normal conditions, if everything is working right and you eat some sugar, let's say you eat some sucrose, when it goes into the body and hits the water, it separates into fructose and glucose. Now glucose can be grabbed up by insulin and burned if it can get it in the cell, but the fructose has to go through some other conversions which puts stress on the liver. If the liver is already under stress because you're taking a huge number of medications which will not allow it to work right, the environment is loading you with all kinds of toxins and of course some of the blood studies indicate that almost everybody now has 100 to 150 different organic chemicals circulating in their blood so the, the, the liver is trying to have to take care of that but its normal function would be if you took some extra sugar the insulin would put into the cells what was needed to burn and what was not needed would be pulled out of the blood by the liver and stored up as glycogen. It converts it to a form called glycogen and holds it in sore. Now later when the sugar goes down a message comes from the pancreas via the islets of longer Han A cells and produces something called glycogon, which is a hormone, and a hormone is a messenger, goes over to the liver and says, the sugar is dropping in the blood, we need more sugar back in to keep it level. So then the liver's job is to convert this glycogen back into glucose, so and empty it back into the blood so you can maintain level blood sugar. And that's what should go on between meals. The excess should be stored and then released back. And that's assuming the liver's working right. Well, there's two problems if the liver gets overstressed and if it gets the wrong fatty acids. If it gets bad fatty acids, the cell membrane is built out of bad fatty acids that will not transport the glucose in properly with the insulin. So then you get a buildup of blood sugar. The liver then is unable to pull out that excess sugar and store it to release it later so you get this buildup of sugar in the blood and what do we have? We have type 2 diabetes. So if you keep on going it gets to be pretty bad if that keeps happening over and over and over. <clears throat> so we get back to the cell membrane problem. If the sugar can't be transported into the cells in the blood and if the liver can't pull it out then it really stays high. What happens if you get too much sugar in the blood? It damages the peripheral nerves first which means you develop uh, neuropathy of the hands and feet. <clears throat> it impairs blood circulation in the small vessels and therefore uh, the legs in particular the circulation gets very poor and then you start to develop diabetic ulcers and gangrene and then you start losing your feet and your legs and things of that nature. <clears throat> the third, third thing is those blood vessels that supply the blood to your retina of your eye are affected and therefore your vision starts to go bad. And it damages the vessels in the kidneys and so the kidneys start to go bad. So it's a race between are you going to die from kidney failure, you're going to die from gangrene, from the leg circulation being cut off, or are you are going to go blind first and then go through all that? It depends on the person. <clears throat> but that, that's what can happen. Now, when diets were better and the nutrients were better, there was hardly ever type 2 diabetes. And if it happened, it happened in somebody very, very old whose nutrition was bad and or their body was worn out and they weren't absorbing properly and so forth. <clears throat> but guess what we have now? We have an epidemic of not 70 or 80 or 90 year old people, but now 
all the way down to six and eight year old kids. We see them with excess fat because the liver can't pull the glucose out and the insulin can't get it into the cells and we have the kids putting on a lot of weight and we have them become type 2 diabetic. Now when they become a type 2 diabetic that early, down the road they're going to be on insulin trying to push it into the cells. In other words, they overload you with insulin, which is damaging to the body. So we've got a very serious problem. It is an epidemic and it's not only in older people or even middle-aged people, it's all the way down to six to eight year old, year old people. And so what does medicine do? Well, gee, we need to research why these kids are having that. Well, I don't think it really takes a lot of research. It takes a lot of knowledge about nutrition and chemistry in the body <clears throat> and an understanding of how the body functions. That's how you're going to correct the problem. But we're having trouble with that because the soil is depleted and therefore the food that's grown in depleted soil is depleted of minerals and nutrients that are needed and therefore your body's not getting the nutrients it needs. So, how are we ever going to solve the problem? We have to solve the problem at the root and I mentioned it before, the miracle men of the 20s and 30s who realized that the soil was being depleted and that the only way to get those nutrients in efficiently was to eat food that was growing in nutrient-rich soil. Are we going to correct that? I doubt it for a while because the big growers make too much money the way they're doing it now. All they have to do is put a few macro minerals in to make sure that the plant will grow and whether the plant has any nutritional value has nothing to do with it. As long as it looks like a uh, carrot or it looks like lettuce or it looks like whatever, then people buy it and eat it and think they're doing well. Now, organic growing can be helpful because growing something organically means you're not using pesticides and a lot of chemicals and so therefore if you eat organically grown fruit, food you can avoid that but if the soil that it's growing in is still missing the nutrients, guess what? I don't care whether you grow it organic or not, it's still missing the nutrients and so your body's going to become deficient. And since the bulk of the people anymore depend on their food coming from commercial growing and food processing companies, all they have to do is throw in there a lot of sucrose and a lot of bad fats, polyunsaturated oils, and guess what you have? You have bad cell walls and therefore the cells don't work right. So that's the beginning of the real degenerative problems in the body. Now there's more things that you need to know and, and there's no time to go into detail like we should. I mentioned the book Sugars That Heal which are good. We are in the process, I'm setting up a page in my website on mindyourhealthcast.com about the whole sugar issue. It's going to be abbreviated but we're going to have some more resources. For example, there is a a um, a ebook that we're going to have that you can download free called Change Your Sugar, Change Your Life that goes into more detail about these and about a good source of one of these glyconutrients that's extremely healthy that you can use that will improve your health. And how will it improve your health? Well, it doesn't fight disease. It's going to correct your body so your body can take care of itself along with the good fats. Now recently I mentioned that I ran across an article that said that when the cell walls were made up of the bad polyunsaturated oils, it actually impaired the movement of oxygen into the cells. Now it not only impairs the oxygen, it impairs lots of things getting into the cell that should get in there, assuming you have the nutrients to begin with. But anyhow it impairs it. So the research study that they did, they wanted to know what could flush out those bad fats or oils so that the cell membrane could cross over the oxygen. Now if you remember from my series I did on cancer, the, one of the problems with cancer is, is that the deficiency of oxygen getting into the cell can cause the cell to change its whole chemistry and not need oxygen, it just needs lots of sugar. And so anyhow, uh, the right fat 
they hoped, if they could find it, would flush it out. And it wasn't fish oil, and it wasn't a lot of other oils. It was organic flaxseed oil would push the, the omega-3s and that would push the bad oils out of the cell membrane and replace them with good oils and hence improve oxygen uh, flow into the cell. Of course, other nutrients and other factors also. Now we got onto this thing about cholesterol and fats and we got everybody scared. Uh, many years ago they started talking about low fat, no fat diets and all that. Well, it was learned way back in the 30s by the Nazi party in Germany that if you gave no, a person no fatty acids whatsoever for 90 days, a high percentage of them would die because they're so crucial in body function. Okay, so we got everybody scared about fats and cholesterol and all that. And of course I've mentioned before, but I'll mention again, that cholesterol has nothing to do with cardiovascular problems. I've mentioned some of the books, The Great Cholesterol Con, The Truth About What Really Causes Heart Disease and How to Avoid It. This is written by a researcher. Another one called The Hidden Truth About Cholesterol Lowering Drugs by Shane Allison who actually was a chemist with a company that made the statins and guess what? He left the company, now he's telling people they know that cholesterol does not cause the cardiovascular problems, number one, or and the placking. Number two, they know that the statin drugs are not only dangerous but can be fatal. Uh, this is coming from the mouth of a man who was working with it. Another one put out by another researcher called the cholesterol hoax, and there's several put out by MDs, PhDs, I mean I've got a whole shelf now of these credible people, people who are either PhD researchers or are MDs, and in a few cases they're both an MD and a PhD, and they're saying there's nothing to it, including one of the original people in the Framingham study that's always quoted as showing a relationship between cholesterol and placking and cardiovascular problems. Not true. So, it was interesting, I've been saying that, and I was saying it over the years, I was saying it way back before any of this stuff came along, but just recently I ran across an, an interesting essay done by a lady by the name of Stephanie Seneff, S-C-N-E-F-F, -F, or I'm sorry, S-E-N-E-F-F, -F, Seneff. And um, anyhow, she is a researcher at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Now this is not from her research there because that's she's doing some other research, but this is after she has studied all of the information about cholesterol and placking and cardiovascular problems and statins. And so that's basically what it's about. It's called Statins and Myoglobin, How Muscle Pain and Weakness Progress to Heart, Lung and Kidney Failure. The topic of, and as she says, the topic of this essay is unrelated to my research in MIT because that's not what she's researching, but she has looked at all the research and is a researcher, meaning she's someone competent to know is the research saying what it's supposed to be saying. And here's what she says in her introduction. Statin drug use has steadily increased over the last several decades due to the widespread belief that cholesterol reduction is an important step in preventing heart disease. It is undeniable that statins are effective, now wait till you hear what she means by effective, they can decrease serum cholesterol levels from over 300 decibels per decibel, I'm not saying that right, it's, anyhow it's, it's the blood cholesterol number they use, um, uh, and at over 300 all the way down to what they call normal in a matter of weeks. For a person who already has normal cholesterol lower, statins can drive their cholesterol down to levels not seen in nature. Statins have also been shown to reduce the relative risk of heart attacks in men in their 50s by as much as 30%. Now, however she says, but because heart attacks are relatively rare for this segment of population, the absolute risk is only on the order of 2%. Now see, I, I told you earlier that how you can lie with statistics, but when she has adjusted that for the actual heart attack level in that group, that reduces the number down to about 2%. So that means 98% of the people won't have a heart attack whether they took statins or not. 
or lowered her cholesterol. Now. A point that is often missed by the person being treated. They don't, they, you know, they miss that point when they read that. All drugs have potential side effects. With any drug, it's a matter of weighing the risk to benefit factors to decide whether the drug is warranted. Statin drugs have a remarkably diverse set of side effects, including cognitive and memory impairment, reduced libido, and muscle pain and weakness. The drug manufacturers claim the incidence of side effects is relatively rare, but often side effects don't appear until several months or even years into the treatment. Now that says in many cases that's true. In some cases it's not true, it comes on very early. In many of these cases it may not be obvious that the statin drug is the cause of the problem. This is especially true because these side effects can easily be attributed to increasing age. In fact, I will show later statin side effects can best be interpreted as an acceleration of the aging process. In other words, they cause the body to age and fall apart very much faster. So we don't have time to get into all this here, but she says, I have argued in previous essays that statins may increase the risk to Alzheimer's disease as well as sepsis, cancer, and heart failure. <clears throat> it's a whole, uh, I, I may be able to get that on the site too. That's a whole big essay and she goes into detail why statins should not be taken at all because that's what she concludes because the the benefit to risk ratio is ridiculous because the um, more people are going to be killed from the drug or seriously impaired than are from the heart the, from the statistic that they argue. Okay, I think I've given you enough to think about but um, I want you to realize that it's extremely important that the cell membrane have its integrity which means the right type of sugar and the right type of fats and cholesterol is one of those that's needed to make it work properly and if they don't have it the cell cannot function properly and you're going to be in big trouble. Now she, she discusses later on in here that's one of the things that happens. The cell membrane ultimately starts to disintegrate taking statins. Now I've said it before, in fact I said it before they even released them on the market, they're going to kill a lot of people and the fact is that they are sometimes not as fast as other times but it does destroy the liver, you know they're supposed to monitor your liver to make sure that the um, uh, liver is not being overly destroyed by taking the statins because they affect the functional cells of the liver and that's how they block the production of cholesterol which is an imperative for you to have a healthy body, you have to have the cholesterol. And of course the numbers are interesting. I know the cholesterol always goes up when you're under high stress, which hardly anybody in our society today isn't. I've mentioned before when I first studied medicine, 125 was high in cholesterol. Most people were running uh, 95, 100, 105. And now the upper limit is 200, some labs 220 and now some 240. But in any case they keep giving you these drugs to push it down and push it down and somebody came in recently, their cholesterol was like 70 or 80, they're in serious trouble because without enough cholesterol you can't rebuild the cell walls and they don't function properly and the, the, you know that in order to go very long with that kind of a cholesterol number that things are falling apart in the body including the cell walls and when that voltage goes down, I didn't get into that yet, but when that voltage drops down to about 45 that cell starts to become a malignant cell. So you have to keep the voltage up and in order to keep the voltage up you have to have the right sugars and the right fatty acids to make it work right and to maintain health. And it takes a lot of things coming together to make that happen. So be sure and be watching, it's not up yet but within the next week to 10 days we should have a page up on the sugars in particular because it's so important to me that you have the right sugars available in the body. I know the liver is overworked today, it's not going to be very easy for it to build some of those essential sugars that carry on other functions than make energy in the body. Most people are getting ample amounts of glucose, in fact they're overloading because they take so much sucrose that 50% of it immediately is glucose and the other 50% roughly is going to have to be converted by the liver first 
and then it's going to become glucose. So, it was nice being with you again. I hope I've raised some questions because, as I've said before, one of the big purposes of my broadcast is provoke you to go look. Don't take it because I said it. I'm giving you resources. You go read for yourself. You can go to Amazon and put on cholesterol and you'll come up with a dozen or two dozen books written by credible people that are telling you cholesterol is not the cause of cardiovascular problems and that high cholesterol, if you're under high stress, really is very important. And that's why your liver makes more of it. Remember that the purpose of these broadcasts are to give you provocative information to get you to look into it for yourself. We give you ample references of very credible people uh, that it's all out there. It's a matter that nobody wants to call your attention to it because too much money is being made treating your symptoms forever. And of course, if your body degenerates, then that's new treatments and new drugs and new uh, income into the medical industry. So at any rate, I would like you to go to the website and look at the page and we'll introduce you a little bit more. Nothing real detailed, but we'll give you the resources. If they're not in, they will be in our book list, but I think most of these are already. Uh, except that there will be a free download of the uh, ebook, Change Your Sugar, Change Your Life, and we'll be telling you about a source of good sugar you can use that uh, has actually health benefits, part of these glyconutrients that we're talking about. So until the next time, remember to go to our site, mindyourhealthcast.com. You can leave your comments if you want to, and of course you can from the videos. And also you can click the link that goes to our alternative health and prevention website about the work that I do with patients. Um, and we're we're open for questions or criticisms or whatever. It doesn't bother me if you don't agree with me, but I, I believe, and that I'm not infallible, but I'd say that most of the things I present here, I spend a lot of hours researching, not back along the way only, but right before I do the broadcast to see if there's anything new out there that I might have missed. So it was nice being with you again, and until our next broadcast, be healthy.